It's great to see you all here for a very special presentation. And I hope that most of you have had a chance to see the, um, the installation in the artist project space. And if not, um, this will only whet your appetite and you'll want to come back and see it for yourself. Um, I want to, before I tell you more about tonight's presentation, I also want to just do a call out to F Philip Haas. You can stand up because you'll see him later. Um, he is, he's working on an exhibition and a performance piece where he becomes the sculpture, um, which is going to open next week. So come back next Wednesday for Schnitzer Cinema and Philip will be showing some of his um, film work in that, and that will entice you to come back again and again and again and see what he does with his um, performance piece, which is a new direction that he's taken in terms of putting himself in his work, and is kind of, we're a premiere and he's figuring it out. So you can see what you think about it, but we're really thrilled to have you here, and so glad we can do that. And that's gonna be in the Schnitzer Gallery. Um, so, two years ago, a little, a little, almost two years ago, I guess, Richard and I um, were in the Venice Biennale, and you see so many things when you go to art shows, and you go from one thing to the next to the next. And we'd gotten to the South African Pavilion and went through these black curtains and got in there, and we couldn't leave. Um, we just stayed there and watched this piece passage over and over again. And it, I, it, it really takes a hold of you and it's so beautiful and so amazing. So then I think about a year ago, years or so later, um, we went to Art Basel in Miami and walked through one of the art fairs and saw what had to be um, a photograph from the shoot that was on the wall. And it was like, whoa, that looks really familiar. So it's like, is this from Passage? And the uh, gallery that, that represents Mohau is in Amsterdam, um, Ron Mandos Gallery. And it was like, yeah, it's like, oh my God, this was our favorite piece. And um, it turned out that there were, I can't remember how many editions, like 11 or 12 or something of this work. And almost all of them had been sold in Europe. And um, thanks to an endowment that we received a couple years ago um, for contemporary art, we were actually able to acquire it for ourselves. So not that I've been in there every day just you know, watching it, but I'm hoping all of you will um, because it's a wonderful piece and it's really exciting. And Mohau is just an amazing artist, as you will hear today. So um, every once in a while, your dreams come through. And in this, I, we are so happy to be able to share it with all of you. So um, I'm going to go into more of an official um, introduction, which is um, from the website mostly. So it's, it's right, I guess. Um, material metaphor and the black body are the tools that Mohamed Asaking uses to explore the influence of South Africa's violent history that has been ignored in today's society on how we understand our cultural, political, and social roles as human beings in post-colonial Africa, and in particular, post-apartheid South Africa represented through film, large-scale photographic prints, installations, and performances. His work, as he says, doesn't start off with an attempt to portray violence, but it becomes mesmerizing, because although we might recognize history as our past, the body is indifferent to social changes, so it remembers. Mohamed Asakin, and I'm sorry if I'm saying your last name completely wrong, but was born in Soweto in 1986 and lives and works between Johannesburg and Cape Town. He completed his undergraduate degree at the Michaelis School of Fine Art in Cape Town in 2009 and then worked toward his master's degree at the same institution. His work engages race, the militarization of society, and the deep divides of post-apartheid South Africa and the post-colonial continent. 
He interrogates the collective narratives that inform our experience of the world, in particular, those that evoke the black body as a site of fragmentation and distortion. He was awarded the Sassol, Sassol New Signatures Award for 2011. He has exhibited at Volta, New York, the Saatchi Gallery in London, Dakar, uh, Biennial in Dakar, Focus 11 in Basel, and Stevenson Cape Town over many years. Not that many years, he's relatively young. In, in 2017, as I mentioned, Passage was um, representing South Africa at the Venice Biennale, but it's also been shown at the Johannesburg Art Gallery, the Iziko South African National Gallery, Cape Town, and the Sacha Gallery in London. Um, there are a number of places that have his collections. I think those are the ones I mentioned, plus ours. Um, and he's represented in many private collections. So I know he's put together a wonderful program for us. I also want to thank the Division of Equity and Inclusion. They've started a recent grants program to build um, access and inclusion diversity across campus. And um, they've become a really great partner with us, as we have, we hope, with them, and are um, also responsible for allowing us to bring you here. So um, please welcome our wonderful guest. Yes. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Hi. Yeah. Uh, thank you all for coming. And I think I would like to start by thanking you, Joe, uh, for making sure that I come through uh, this part of the world to share my work. Um, it's been an interesting experience being here and connecting with uh, uh, your colleagues as well. Um, yes. Um, so I've, I, I arrived uh, here, I think, on Tuesday. <laughs> and I was coming from Copenhagen. Before Copenhagen, I was in Amsterdam. Uh, before that, I was home. So that was like uh, three weeks, almost a, a month ago. Uh, so I'm hopefully, understandably, a little bit exhausted. Um, uh, so usually I, I get uh, very nervous just before these kinds of engagements, but because I'm so tired, I feel like I'm just... <laughs> I'm, I'm over it. Uh, uh, so again, I would just like to ask if we can have this kind of engagement uh, as more of a conversation as opposed to uh, a formal lecture where I'm saying uh, this is my work, this is what it means and whatnot. Uh, but to aid this conversation, I just thought I should put together a, a, a slide presentation that will assist in sort of giving an, a, a sense of uh, how I work and why I work the way that I do. Um, uh, I had prepared a slide presentation just showing my work. Uh, but I thought maybe it might be a, a, a good exercise to sort of give some kind of context into South Africa, where I come from, because most of my work uh, is in response to that. Um, I've spent uh, probably the past three days talking about uh, the passage project that is now being shown here at the museum. And I thought maybe I should uh, shift the focus a little bit to my previous projects, because all of you will have a chance and opportunity uh, to see this uh, work that's being shown here. Um, maybe just to start with a little bit of biography, uh, my name is Mohao Mudisa Geng. I am born in 1986. I know there was a misprint that said I was born in 46 or something like that. <laughs> I, said that. I said it wrong. Yes, yes. Um, I am born in Soweto, uh, which is a township just 45 minutes outside of Johannesburg. Um, Soweto is uh, known uh, for, uh, I guess, the political activity that happened there during the uh, 60s right through to uh, uh, 94 when South Africa gets its chance to elect its first democratic uh, uh, government. I'm born to two parents, uh, both of them working class. Uh, and my mother comes from uh, the Free States which is in the center of the country. And my father comes from the Northwest, which is uh, like further north 
bordering between South Africa and, and Botswana. Um, my parents arrived in Johannesburg, um, like most uh, Joburgers, to uh, seek uh, a better life and access to economy. And um, like most South Africans that uh, uh, come from elsewhere, uh, they uh, met with a lot of harsh conditions. Um, um, yeah, so I'll, I'll go through the slides and hopefully uh, this kind of um, departure, my departure, my parents' departure will become apparent in, in, the, in the presentation. Um, like I said, it's not a formal presentation, so I just have some images that are piled into a slide that I'll just speak through uh, as I converse with you. Um, so my first, okay, so I left to draw, uh, uh, Soweto in 2006. That was my first time leaving Soweto to go live elsewhere, and I moved to Cape Town. Um, where I studied my, where I did my fine art degree, my undergraduate, and I also did my master's there. Um, this was after a trip that I took in 2004. I was lucky enough to be one of a group of about eight to ten students uh, that were uh, selected as part of an exchange program between our school in Soweto and uh, the American school in, in London. Uh, it, it was a cultural exchange. So this group of uh, American students whose parents uh, worked and lived in London visited Soweto. And about uh, six months later, we, we were called to the principal's office to say, uh, you have been asked to visit London. And of course, we were, both, we were all excited about that. Um, but I think I mentioned that because it was an interesting moment in, in me thinking about my career and where I would end up. Because for the first time, I was exposed to art institutions, to people having uh, uh, collections uh, of artworks in their, in, in their private spaces. And um, I visited the Tate Modern for the first time. And I'm not sure about the artist's last name, but I think his uh, name is uh, Olaf, who had um, a sphere uh, suspended in the uh, turbine hall at the Tate. Uh, and uh, people were just lying underneath looking at the spherical ball. And uh, it sort of um, registered with me. And this was 2004, I was doing my metric. So at the end of that year, I needed to make a decision about uh, what I would uh, be doing. Uh, so I knew I needed to do fine art. And um, yeah, in 2005, I enrolled into um, a design program, a foundation course, where basically if you don't have any background in, in, in art, you were taken through all kinds of processes to prepare you. In 2006, I was lucky enough to get a scholarship to the University of Cape Town, where I studied, did my undergrad, and graduated. Um, so Johannesburg, uh, I don't know if um, a, a lot of you would know about it, but uh, I'm sure it's in the South African story, Johannesburg features uh, quite prominently. Um, but it, uh, in, in, 1860, in 1886, uh, there's the discovery of gold uh, in Johannesburg. And um, this discovery of gold, that's a gold rush where uh, people from all across the world uh, congregate in Johannesburg uh, to try to sort of gain access to this uh, new economical um, um, opportunity. Um, as a result of that, you have a lot of black South Africans that are moving from different parts of uh, southern Africa, uh, arriving in Johannesburg to work uh, either on temporary or permanent uh, contracts as miners. Um, and so I, I wrote some notes just to also go through the, the uh, the, the lineage of how Johannesburg uh, comes about. Um, and within three years of uh, this discovery of gold, South uh, Johannesburg becomes uh, one of the most populous uh, settlements in all of South Africa. Um, and uh, because South Africa has this colonial history, there's always been a comp uh, competition between the British and the Dutch uh, and because of this competition over this gold rush, we have the Anglo-Boer War, 
which happens in uh, between 1899 and uh, 1901, after which the city of Johannesburg uh, falls under British rule. Um, with the growing population of uh, black South Africans arriving in Johannesburg to try uh, to work in the mines, uh, you have a situation where uh, the British colony tries to control the influx of black people in the city and they start to move them to the margins of the city and this is how places like Soweto and other townships uh, sort of develop uh, along the margins of, um, uh, the, of Johannesburg. And the, the living conditions there are, are not, uh, it, it was not uh, uh, planned out, so you just basically settle where you can. Um, and I was born in Soweto, uh, which uh, sort of results from that kind of uh, activity of, pe of people being pushed uh, to the margins. Um, so this um, effort to try to uh, sort of retain the city and, and make it uh, uh, accessible only to uh, the white population in South Africa starts um, um, a long history of racial segregation, uh, which is formalized uh, when the National Party, uh, which is this right-wing uh, political party, uh, introduces what we now know as apartheid, which is a, a system of um, governance and a set of rules uh, that institutionalize racism and control how people move around uh, the country black people, how black people uh, move around the country. And uh, they introduce uh, past laws, which is basically you, you as a black person, you, had, uh, you would need to have an internal pa uh, passport uh, that sort of explains why you are in Johannesburg. And mostly if you are, if you are a minor or a laborer of sorts, you would have permission to be in the city. But, uh, uh, as time progresses, um, the government establishes what they call homelands, uh, which are further out in the rural areas. Uh, so uh, people were moved to these homelands, and you would uh, commute or, or like travel to Johannesburg to work, and after six months, you'd have to go back home. And um, most of these men that arrived in Johannesburg uh, lived in uh, hostels. So. Uh, these were like um, single-sex um, housing situations, but uh, when I think about the, uh, the kind of conditions that people lived in, it's, it's very similar to uh, uh, concentration camps or labor camps where people would just be housed and uh, the, the, the treatment wouldn't be all that great. But as long as they were available uh, and ready to offer their labor, to the mines and then to part. So I started with this image because um, I, I just like it, uh, because, uh, mainly because it, it represents um, um, my kind of interest in photography. Um, but you had a lot of people departing from the rural areas of uh, South Africa and arriving in Johannesburg and also wanting to sort of keep this connection between themselves and their families. So photography was an interesting way of sort of connecting to uh, where they came from. Um, so, so this is an image of uh, uh, young African men that arrived to Johannesburg through the government uh, campaign to recruit uh, young men from uh, around Southern Africa to arrive uh, and work in, in the mines. And most of them would arrive in Johannesburg still in their traditional uh, clothes and, and attire. And uh, through time or through the time in Johannesburg, they would assimilate to this Western standard of being a gentleman. So you'd wear a suit, you'd wear um, a, a brimmed hat of sorts. Um, so th that's the kind of uh, uh, hybrid image that starts to uh, develop where people would have like bees and things like that, but then they would also have these Western uh, clothes as part of uh, sort of assimilating to the urban context. Um, so this, the image that you're looking at now is, is uh, people basically signing up to be laborers where you would 
put your fingerprints down um, and you would be given a place to stay and uh, that is where you lived. Um, and uh, wh when I think about this, I feel like it represents the beginning of the, uh, the breaking of the black family. Because all these men congregated in Johannesburg, leaving their families, their wives, their children, um, which later on uh, creates all kinds of uh, problems in the South African uh, society. Um, uh, most of these images I got from a book called uh, The Rise and Fall of Apartheid, uh, which was uh, edited and authored by Okwi Enezwo and uh, a South African uh, theorist as well. And most of these men would have to, would be subjected to these uh, inspections, so you had to go through the, this health inspection to make sure that uh, you are not going to be a liability to these companies, and they had to make sure that you're healthy and, and you're all that. Uh, so there's these kinds of images that start to happen, um, uh, which I, I know are very difficult, but I, I just wanted to refer to them. Um, that is an image of uh, uh, the, the treason trial, which is, um, I'm not sure about the dates, but uh, uh, the treason trial is, uh, there was a campaign um, by the government at the time to sort of raid uh, or to conduct a series of raids all across the country uh, trying to um, sort of address the issue of black rebellion because when um, black people gathered in these urban centers they were aware of their conditions and they mobilized and started having uh, political consciousness. Uh, so the treason trial was a way of trying to curb that kind of uh, resistance. And um, I think over 156 people were arrested and they were put on trial, but uh, all of them uh, walked away because they were, the charges could not really stick. Uh, of those uh, 156 people that were uh, uh, detained, uh, Mandela was one of them. Uh, two years later, in 1962, Mandela is brought back and he's charged with uh, uh, again, treason or trying to overthrow the government in what we know as the Rivonia trials. And uh, at that occasion, Mandela is sentenced to life imprisonment uh, uh, on Robben Island, and he ends up spending 27 years uh, of his life uh, confined uh, in this island. And he's jailed with uh, seven of his other comrades who were leaders of the African National Congress, uh, which is the, the, um, the champions of, of the liberation struggle in South Africa. Um, but there's also, uh, as people move to uh, the urban centers, they start to assimilate. And there's a lot of uh, references to what is happening in, in this part of the world in America. So there's commonalities in, in the experience of, of being in Johannesburg and Sophia Town and what happens in, in Harlem. Uh, so there's jazz, there's music, there's fashion, there's uh, people uh, like poets, uh, artists who congregate in these spaces and, and start to uh, inform each other's thinking about the conditions that they were living in. And uh, people like Miriam Makeba, who travels the rest of uh, the whole world, basically talking about the situation in South Africa, basically come from uh, Sophia Town. And you have Huma Sekela, who moved over here and made uh, hits and um, sort of connected with uh, Nina Simone, uh, Harry Belafonte, and all these folks who sort of had the same kind of issues, even though uh, there was an ocean between their experiences. So that image is repeated. So this is a work I made in uh, 2010. It's my introduction to photography. And uh, in this image, I am trying to refer to myself and trying to deal with the issue of identity. And um, there's a pointer here. So. When I started, I wanted to make reference to my experience as a black South African. Uh, I wanted to make reference to the landscape. I wanted to make reference to ethnicity. 
I wanted to make a reference to the fact that uh, most black people were uh, exploited for their labor. So I needed to find ways uh, in which I could uh, have all these conversations um, reconciled, or con uh, reconciled in, in one image. So I started making reference to uh, the land by um, using uh, powder, uh, black oxide, which is like a pigment that people use in, in construction to give color to concrete and, and different kinds of uh, surfaces. But for me, in this image, it represented uh, the idea of land, of, of, of uh, geography. And I also wanted to make reference to this idea or this departure from uh, the more traditional uh, lifestyle in the rural areas uh, where uh, tradition was, was still quite uh, uh, irrelevant in how people and how society was was ordered, so that leopard print vest uh, refers to um, um, the the Zulu tradition or uh, indigenous uh, South African traditions, and the leopard print not necessarily the leopard print but leopard was usually worn by warriors, uh, so you would go out in the field and uh, you would hunt uh, these kinds of animals. And you, when you bring back that animal, it would be a sign of you uh, uh, being a warrior, and it was a rite of passage of sorts. But uh, due to this departure from that kind of lifestyle, uh, um, young men or men that arrive in Johannesburg still want to have this attachment to uh, where they come from, but uh, you are in an urban context, so the closest thing that you find is um, uh, uh, like these synthetic uh, Chinese-made um, vests that somehow still connect you to um, your heritage and your lineage. So there's this hybrid identity that starts to form uh, in, in the urban centers of South Africa. Uh, in this image, I wanted to refer to the idea of skin. So there's, there's uh, several layers of, of skin. So that's animal skin, but it's a synthetic uh, version of that. And I'm wearing an apron, which uh, represents, or which makes reference to the idea of labor, or the condition of, of, of work, and being in these kinds of environments. But it's also made from uh, uh, cowhide, which uh, is also quite relevant in, in, in uh, our culture as South Africans. But uh, I also start using this uh, hat, uh, a trilby hat, which uh, is one of the ways that uh, um, you would sort of assimilate to this urban context by wearing a, a, a hat, because it refers to the idea of being a gentleman, the idea of uh, masculinity uh, from the Western context. Um, but in the way that I uh, use it in, the, in my photography, um, you usually just catch uh, the brim of it, and, and it, it translates as a halo. So you have this um, uh, a person who, uh, in society, you're at the lowest, uh, um, like you, you're like at the lowest possible class. But then in these images, it becomes an ordained uh, image because of this uh, idea of a halo. So I just wanted to work with that kind of um, uh, contrast. Um, and I, okay, so an, another thing, there, there are things that I'll remember. This work was 2010, so I, I, there's things that will come to me as I look through the images myself. Uh, but growing up in Soweto, there used to be a game uh, that we, it wasn't necessarily a game, but um, I call it a game. But if uh, two people were fighting, there would be a third person that comes in between them and holds up. Uh, sort of picks up two handfuls of, of sand, of, of soil, and uh, sort of puts it in between them. And the person who was brave enough uh, would uh, slap the contents out of the hand as a way of intimidating uh, his opponent. So I responded to that, uh, that, that idea of using uh, soil or, or land as a way of uh, uh, um, sort of resolving conflict. So that's, that's the reference that, that I have, or that I'm making in these images. But I also like the fact that uh, when you put your hands together like that, 
and this plume uh, of dust covers your face, it sort of distorts um, uh, your identity in a sense. Uh, I, I like that kind of uh, element of these images. Mm. Um, then I started playing around with this head floating around in space. And I like the fact that it obscures your face, but it also uh, uh, makes it hollow, uh, as if there's a way that you can look into it or, or access it uh, in some way. So this is my entry into working with photography. I was trained as a sculptor. And uh, when I left uh, the university, I realized that I just left this insulated environment where if I needed to make a sculpture, I'd just go to the workshop and I'd be able to produce. But as soon as I left that, I realized that I, I couldn't, I didn't have um, the ability to sustain my uh, sculptural work because I would need a space to work from. I would need materials, and sculpture is usually like this long, drawn-out process, and it just didn't make sense. Uh, but at the time, I had access to cameras and studios, so I, I just thought it, it, it's, it's a, the most, <coughs> it was an immediate way of trying to get to these ideas that I wanted to express, and photography sort of uh, gave me that entry. Um, and then in 2013, so most, uh, I'm skipping a lot. Uh, there's a lot of work between 2010 and 2013, but I'm just uh, moving it along. Uh, in uh, 2013, I <laughs> continued with my photographic practice, again, uh, looking at the history and legacy of violence in South Africa, uh, the colonial history and the apartheid history, uh, but also referring to um, the experience of violence throughout the whole continent. And I'm sure you yourself have seen that wherever there's conflict uh, on the African continent, um, you, that there's either an AK-47 or there's a machete uh, somewhere in there. And I liked, well, I responded to the fact that uh, this machete is, 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 is a, an agricultural tool, but uh, in, in times of conflict, it becomes a very, uh, it becomes a weapon. Um, so I started creating these um, uh, personas or these characters that uh, would somehow enable me to uh, carry this history in, in, in still images. Um, so again, the hat uh, still comes through, but uh, over my face, I have um, these horse blinkers that I had designed and uh, I had them made to fit um, the human head. Um, but uh, the idea behind that was that um, history has a way of sort of uh, narrowing your vision. And in the South African context as well, uh, history plays out in a way that uh, you only focus on uh, a particular point and you don't have a, a 360 view of, of uh, how you come to be. So that's what uh, that, uh, the blinkers represent. And I'm holding uh, these um, whips, uh, we call them shampoks in South Africa, uh, which were used by uh, the government and the state at the time to control uh, the black population during protests and things like that. So they would use that uh, as a way of intimidating and, and controlling crowds. Um, so yeah, I think at the, at the beginning of uh, my practice, uh, this self-portraiture project, I was just wanting to pull from different um, elements of the South African history and put them together, but I wasn't necessarily thinking about uh, how these uh, different references exist uh, as one, or exist in one image. Um, yeah, some, some more of the same kind of reference. And that uh, leopard print vest still shows through over there. You can't see it properly, but uh, it, it still comes through. What's the platform? Uh, that's, that's just the, uh, the platform in the studio. It's like this infinity curve. But I wanted to uh, keep, I, I didn't want to crop it out. I wanted to make it obvious that this is uh, a set up image. Um, and in this image, I'm wearing a, a black robe. 
uh, which I had uh, made to make reference to the idea of widowhood. So in, in South Africa, um, if uh, you have lost your husband, uh, you would have to wear a black robe for a period of between six months to a year as a way of signifying your process of mourning and you would be isolated from uh, your community. And there are certain things that uh, sort of def define your, your experience in that time. So I wanted to make reference to, to that kind of uh, experience of loss um, by making reference to this black robe that I'm wearing. But there's also interesting things that start to happen with the, with the lighting. So right at the bottom there, it looks like a ball and claw kind of chair, which uh, is a Victorian uh, piece of furniture that references the colonial, uh, the colonial uh, period in South Africa. Some more of that. Um, but um, I, when I made these images, um, or uh, let's say like probably like within the same year that I made these images, um, it, we had uh, the Marigana massacre. I don't know if you guys would, would be aware of that. But this was um, uh, miners in, in, in uh, the northwest of South Africa uh, sort of took to the streets uh, protesting uh, uh, against the companies, the mine companies, because they wanted better, uh, better uh, um, pay for their labor. Um, and this was like a, a, a one week where uh, the miners were staying away from work. And this mine that was, uh, I think it's called Lonmin, which is a, a UK-based uh, company, sort of was losing millions and millions in that time. And um, the current president of South Africa, Cyril Ramaphosa, was, uh, well, he was a member of the board, uh, but he was politically connected and he could make uh, uh, moves to make sure that this uh, uh, protest comes to an end. Uh, I, I think it will become clear why I'm making reference to this protest in the next images. So my dates are completely wrong. So that's 2013, I'm mean 2012. And the previous images were made in 2012. So uh, I, I don't know if you realize that this is pretty much the same image that I, I, I've been playing. So that to that. Uh, so there's this idea of being robed uh, and holding these traditional weapons. Um, that I, it was just purely by coincidence. So I made this, uh, the photographs, the series, uh, and then later on these images started coming out. Uh, so I, I started connecting to them. Um, so I, I, was, I was trying to figure out how, how does this happen? Is it just coincidence or is there something about the history of violence in South Africa that uh, it, it keeps reoccurring and, and sort of finding its way to the surface? Uh, is there something about the, the national or the collective consciousness where uh, violence is still expressed in, in, in our traditions and in how we protest and in how we relate in general? Um, but in this uh, scenario, um, about 74 miners were shot down by the South African police uh, at the command of the now current uh, president who was a board member and he was trying to protect his investments and his interests. Um, so this happened in 2012 and the only other time in South African history where we find this kind of uh, situation happening is in the 1960s when there was a protest in a place called Shubville against the pass laws, which I, I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, so people gathered in Shubville at, at a police station and in protest, they would take these uh, passports and they would burn them in protest. Uh, and that afternoon, uh, the police responded by shooting uh, live ammunition into these crowds. And most of these people were uh, wounded and shot in the back as they were trying to flee. Uh, so I find it interesting that uh, uh, so much time passes, but you still have the same kind of images uh, coming through later on. So 
So again, this is the same lineage of men that uh, arrived in Joburg, in Johannesburg in 1862 uh, during the gold rush. And they are still uh, protesting or sort of trying to deal with their, the, the kind of harsh living conditions and, in, and the inequality of that system. Um, yeah. Some of these images are difficult, but um, uh, it, it's the reality in South Africa. Uh, so, so this is what remains of, of uh, um, a, as a memorial of that experience. So to this day, uh, people are still returning to the site uh, to commemorate uh, and try to revive this memory. Um, so this is the Sharpeville massacre um, uh, that happens in the 1960s. So there was a, a mass a mass burial of the victims of this experience and. You find a lot of these kinds of images in the history of South Africa. So I, I refer to them because in my work, I try to deal with the idea of trauma and the idea of loss and also relating it to my own experiences, my, my own personal experiences of this loss and trauma. Um, so what does this kind of experience uh, do to um, uh, the psychology of, of an entire uh, nation? So that's the day, uh, the Sharpeville Massacre. Today, this day is celebrated as a human rights day in South Africa. Um, but there's also this way of trying to sanitize these uh, problematic moments in history. So instead of saying it's a, it's, it's a commemoration or a, a day to remember the Sharpeville Massacre, we just uh, sort of gloss over it and call it uh, the Human Rights Day. And uh, generations that come after this, uh, this time do not quite, cannot connect to why uh, we have this holiday called the Human Rights Day. So the idea of loss uh, is uh, quite integral to the South African experience. Um, and this leads me to this work called Inzilo. Inzilo is a Zulu word meaning uh, mourning. Uh, it, it sort of hints at this uh, idea of uh, uh, widowhood and going through a process of mourning. Uh, and these, uh, again, that's that black robe that I referred to. So these ladies are um, um, two of the widows of uh, these 74 men that passed away. Uh, and after, after this experience happened, the, the government uh, established a commission to try uh, figure out what happened. And these women were sort of paraded in the media because they would have to co show up in court and listen to these testimonials. And uh, so it was like this period of mourning just extended and it became a, a spectacle of sorts. Um, so I make this work in 2013. Again, it's, it's uh, not necessarily in response to these events, but in, in response to my own experiences. And I'm dealing with the idea of loss and uh, mourning. So this was um, a sort of a performance uh, in front of the camera. And it was documented in images and uh, with video as well. And I have uh, black uh, clay, not clay, I mean wax. So I put um, a molten wax on, on my hands and on my feet. And basically, the performance is me trying to peel off this black uh, skin to reveal something underneath. Um, I will show you the video. So I, 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 I put on a lot of videos in there because I didn't think that I would be able to get through the talk. So um, yeah, but in, my, in most of my photographs, there's always this, there's always this uh, moment of, of, of catharsis, of this explosive moment of release. Uh, so. Maybe instead of just talking a lot about it, I should just go through it. So again, there's the uh, trail be head, which uh, still has the same reference. Oops, sorry. And you have the, uh, that black uh, wraparound kind of apron, 
uh, which has the same kind of reference to uh, the process of mourning and loss. And you have the chair, which I'm always trying to refer to the colonial kind of experience. Um, I'll skip through it because it's uh, quite long. Um, some of these uh, images and videos are available on my website, so you can revisit them later on. So there's this process of shedding, of letting go of one skin to inhabit another. Uh, it's, all, it's only video, only video. Yeah. And also in the past, uh, so the South African democracy is about 25 years, and in that time, there's been an effort to sort of move away from our history and, and go through this process of healing and uh, national uh, nation building. Uh, and most of it has been about forgetting the past and moving on. So uh, I think this was my response to that kind of idea of, of transforming or uh, transcending uh, history in a sense. So you find this kind of process in nature uh, where um, like reptiles would uh, uh, shed their skin naturally um, and certain insects would inhabit a cocoon but eventually they would break out of it so that's that kind of reference. It goes on and on. <laughs> And then there's a, a moment where I reversed this process where I'm, I'm putting back the skin back onto uh, my feet as a way of uh, sort of signaling the fact that it, it's never a, a, a finished process. Like it's always going back and forth. Yes. So that was in Zilo, referring to that, uh, yeah, that experience. And then uh, in the same kind of context, I, I did a, a work called Khabose Khangwe, where I was trying to uh, sort of extend this narrative to, um, to the collective. So in, in this image, Oh, in this video, you have this group of uh, m uh, black African men who are constantly trying to stand up and, and be upright, but they never quite get there. Just before they are upright, they uh, go back to uh, being on the ground, and it's just a video that plays uh, in a loop. And there's no sound to this thing, so it's very weird to watch. Um, in 2015, I um, make a work I titled Metamorphosis. Again, I guess you can see, I hope you can see the, uh, the continuation of the same kind of thinking, uh, this idea of, of uh, transforming as a way of dealing with uh, a difficult uh, past. Um, so in this work, I'm, I'm basically, it's always me in my photographs. Uh, in this image, I'm, I'm basically dis disintegrating uh, between different uh, forms. Again, the head uh, still comes through. And this is m uh, one of my favorites favorite uh, projects, I think. Uh. 
And I'm skipping a lot, but uh, then we come to passage. Um, so in 2016, I was approached by uh, a curator who wanted to put together a two-person exhibition. And they wanted it to be a cinema, uh, or they wanted the exhibition to be a cinematic experience. Uh, and for the first time in the history of the South African Pavilion, uh, there was enough time to commission a work. And previously, uh, everything was done in, in, in a rush where a curator would travel across the country visiting uh, artist studios and commercial galleries and picking this and that artist and then putting together a show. Uh, in 2015, I was part of that kind of a uh, process. Uh, I was m uh, part of a larger group of artists that were uh, selected to go to or to represent South Africa in, at the Venice Biennale. But this was the first instance where a, a work was commissioned, uh, where a brief was uh, presented and an artist could respond directly to that. And I was asked to think about the idea of um, uh, marginal histories or, or disappearing histories within the context of South Africa. And I started doing my research and um, uh, it took me to uh, Cape Town or the Cape Colony, uh, which is um, the first place where Europeans uh, arrive uh, to South Africa. And it happens uh, by chance. So, in uh, I think in the 19, I mean, 1440s or so, uh, um, uh, a Portuguese um, explorer, I guess you'd call them, uh, finds their way to Cape Town by accident. They're shipwrecked uh, at the southernmost tip of uh, uh, Africa. And this is how they discover the passage uh, from, the, from the Atlantic Ocean to the east. So uh, in my research into this, so I'm, I'm pulling from different places because uh, I, I didn't structure my uh, conversation properly, but uh, there, I there is a, an economic um, theorist or political economy theorist um, uh, named Adam Smith, uh, who speaks about uh, the two m most important uh, moments in the history of mankind uh, was the discovery of the passage uh, from Europe to uh, the New World, or the discovery of the Americas uh, by Christopher Columbus. And he also cites uh, the second event is the uh, discovery of the passage, sorry, of of the passage to uh, the Indian Ocean uh, via the, uh, the Cape of, of Good Hope. So when uh, um, Vasco da Gama discovers this place, he goes back to uh, Europe. And in 1652, the Dutch East Indian Company sends Jan van Riebeck. Uh, uh, I think he was traveling with like four or five other ships. And they sent him to uh, the southernmost tip of Africa to go set up a refreshment station for the company. Uh, so the idea is that um, when ships travel from uh, Europe across the Atlantic, trying to get to the Indian Ocean, they would stop in Cape Town, uh, where they would refill and uh, continue their journey. Uh, so Jan van Riebeck arrived and set up uh, the Castle of Good Hope, which was basically a fort. Um, and this uh, refreshment station uh, gradually develops into uh, a settlement. Uh, and that is how the history of um, uh, white settlement in, in South Africa, in the su in southern African region, uh, begins. Uh, when they get there, they encounter, um, I guess in the same way that uh, when, when um, uh, Europeans arrive to uh, the New World, they discover uh, native Indians. Um, in South Africa, they discover the Khoisan, which are the indigenous uh, inhabitants of South Africa. And uh, they start to push uh, this population further and further uh, inland, uh, pushing them into the more arid uh, uh, areas of the, of, the, of the country and disconnecting them from their traditional way of, of, of living. 
they disowned them of their livestock and uh, uh, sort of kept pushing them away. And because of that, that meant they couldn't uh, enslave these uh, people. So uh, there was a shortage of labor. And because the Dutch East Indian Company was dealing uh, with uh, moving uh, crops, moving gold, ivory, and all these things across the world, and spices as well, but they also dealt with uh, 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 human beings as cargo. They started shipping um, uh, slaves from the East, East Coast past Madagascar to South Africa, uh, where these uh, uh, slaves were put to work in, in, in the farms and the wine farms and, and working basically in agriculture. Uh, so when I was thinking about this idea of, of a passage, that's the first thing that came to mind. The fact that uh, the two most significant moments in the history of Europe, or that impact Europe, is this departure from, from uh, Europe across the Atlantic uh, to arrive in the New World, and also this passage uh, between this passage from the Atlantic into the Indian Ocean. Before that, the, there wasn't any history of, of maritime life or maritime uh, uh, activity uh, extending to the East. Uh, so the, the, the word passage, in a sense, sort of refers to that geographical uh, positioning of, of uh, South Africa. And in, in a way, uh, the images that I showed you uh, of apartheid South Africa, all of them, uh, come from uh, this this kind of experience where people uh, where w Westerners discover um, South Africa and discover the Indian Ocean, and that is a beautiful, beautiful South Africa, um, and that is an image of Jan van Riebeck. That's him over there with the Dutch flag, meeting uh, the indigenous South Africans, the Khoisan. Um So those, those are the ships that he came with. And for some reason, these, these ships are still quite, um, they, refer, they are referred to quite prominently in, in Dutch, Dutch history. Um, even the names, like the Dromedaries or something like that, uh, they, they are part of that um, uh, uh, consciousness, I guess. Uh, and then, trying to think about uh, other ways of uh, sort of translating this idea of a passage. Uh, in my research, um, I by chance discover that um, in 1917, there was uh, this tragedy that happens in uh, the English Channel, where uh, an, a contingent of, of uh, African native people were taken as part of the, uh, the, the British army to uh, partake in the uh, First World War. Uh, about 600 uh, black um, Africans were taken uh, to go labor in these camps uh, in, in France. Uh, but on their way there, um, they collided uh, with another ship and uh, this boat sank. Um, leaving 600, like over 600 uh, South African men um, um, in these watery graves in uh, the English Channel. So I started, I wanted to make reference to um, this experience or this event in history in my project for the uh, Venice Biennale. Um, again, there's, there's uh, water comes through again as, as uh, a common link between these passages. Uh, so that's an image of uh, uh, the men on their way. That's another image. And in uh, the, the, the passage project, which is showing here at the museum, I wanted to make reference to the kind of costume that these men uh, are dressed in. So uh, one of the three panels shows uh, Apiwe, uh, who is uh, somebody I collaborate with quite a lot, who's dressed in a similar way or in a way that references uh, this kind of uh, um, look. So she's dressed in a, a, a coat 
and she's wearing the same kind of uh, hat and she has those boots. Um, so she is a, a, a direct reference to the sinking of the SS Mendy or these 600 men that perished. And from what I've read, I think uh, most of these men signed up to uh, take part in, 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 in this war because they were promised land. Uh, so the idea is that when you go and you come back, you, you, you can have uh, some kind of claim to a piece of land in South Africa. So that was their motivation to try uh, uh, be part of that experience of uh, belonging. Uh, but not just belonging, but also um, uh, being able to uh, live off the land. Uh, but unfortunately, that never came about. Um, and also, an interesting story that uh, I, I read is that um, when this event happened, uh, the, um, the British colony uh, informed uh, uh, these men, the widows uh, of this event, by giving them, each of them was given a black dress. Um, w yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but then again, I was thinking about uh, other uh, references or other ways that I could frame this idea of, of uh, passages. And around the time that I made this work in 2017, and um, probably for like three years or five years prior, uh, there were a lot of images uh, uh, in international media of. Um, uh, African people and, and uh, Middle Eastern people uh, trying to flee conflict, trying to flee um, difficult climate conditions and uh, just generally, generally trying to look for uh, um, a better access to uh, a better living through the economy. And, and that meant that they needed to move from their homes and find uh, refuge elsewhere. So you had a lot of um, um, North African and West African uh, people crossing the Sahara. So that crossing of that desert as well, that, that stretch of uh, desert is, is also very interesting when you think about the Arab slave trade. Uh, because if, if you are not going uh, out from the East African coast, like Tanzania, Zanzibar, towards uh, uh, the Arab world, you were uh, trekking, basically walking, in these caravans through uh, this desert to arrive at the Horn of Africa so that you can skip over to uh, the, the other continent. Uh, so there's a passage that's implied in, in, uh, in, in the history of the Sahara Desert that it, it's historic as well, um, even biblical, like it's, it's referred to in the Bible as well. Um, but because of these harsh conditions that are happening everywhere, you have a group of um, people leaving their homes, crossing the Sahara, uh, only to arrive in North Africa, where they would then have to cross into the Mediterranean. And they would use these uh, boats that would not uh, see them through. Uh, so you started getting reports of uh, uh, boats capsizing, uh, and, and a lot of frustrated migrants trying to flee these conditions uh, for a better life in Europe but never quite uh, uh, getting there. So there's another reference to a passage, which is not very different from uh, the, 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 the transatlantic uh, slave trade or the uh, Arab slave trade, uh, except this time it was not forced. It was, uh, well, it, I guess it was forced, but it wasn't one person benefiting from taking you from one place to another. Um, yeah. So you have a lot of these kinds of uh, images. Um, of, uh, yeah, and I think even to this day, this is uh, continuing, and I think it's becoming worse and worse. So that that's the again another reference to this idea of passage. So I was trying to put as much as I can into uh, this project that does not just make reference to. Uh, the passage to uh, the, the to the east via the the, uh, the southernmost tip of Africa, uh, but also the passage um, in contemporary times of people trying to flee these conditions. Uh, and then there is um, the reference to the transatlantic slave trade and uh, the Middle Passage. 
and uh, we have uh, this image which um, has been repeated uh, uh, a lot of times, but I think we're all familiar with it. Um, so these ships that were uh, primarily designed to carry uh, bodies stacked up um, in the deck um, on their way to uh, the plantations in America and in the Caribbean. Uh, but I'm sure it, it's very easy to see that it's the same same image. So uh, across centuries, you have the same kind of passages happening. Um, uh, some of them voluntary, some of them involuntary. Uh, and then we come to this. Um, so this is where my, my, uh, my decisions into what to portray, how to portray it, uh, all of this sort of refers to the images that I just shown you. Um, yeah, so that's Apiwe, and she's holding a staff. Um, I've been speaking uh, to uh, various groups uh, here on campus about uh, some of the meanings behind uh, the details. Um, but um, so that's the quote. That's the the military kind of attire. That's the trilby hat, which uh, has been in my work since uh, I started working with photography. And there's the stuff that she's holding. And later on, when I start to uh, relook at these images, so that stuff uh, is not very detailed, but it's, um, it's a circle and it's a cross, and then you have two uh, birds uh, in, in the stuff. But I, I, when I picked it as a prop for this uh, project, I wasn't even thinking of it that way. Um, and then you have this image of Lesoko. Um, I'm happy to answer questions re relating to the details uh, afterwards. Um, but there are obvious references to Southern African uh, culture and tradition. That is the Basotho blanket, which you've seen uh, appropriated in, in, in movies and things like that. So you see it a lot in Black Panther, uh, taken completely out of context. But I guess I'm, I'm guilty of the same thing. But I feel like I have, I have, a, I have a, a direct connection to what it means, as opposed to just. Um, and she has a whip. She has a whip, um, which again refers to uh, the kind of treatment, uh, the dehumanization, and the violence of uh, the slave trade. Uh, again, as a way of uh, um, uh, controlling and subjugating. Um, but she uses it in, in, in this context um, to sort of whip uh, the water, almost like thrashing the water. Uh, you could read that in, in many ways. But uh, I guess the water is a symbol, is a site of all these traumas that have happened over time. Um, yeah. And she's wearing um, these uh, white beads uh, and on her neck as well. And I was explaining to a group earlier that uh, another reference to a passage um, in my spirituality and in my uh, culture is that as a spiritually gifted person, you, you would have to go through this process of initiation uh, where you would be told that you have to um, commune with your spirits uh, by living underwater. Uh, so for those that know uh, that, that living underwater could actually be literally being submerged and, and, and communing with uh, um, uh, spirit animals uh, under, under, uh, under the water. So those beads, if you go to South Africa and you travel to South Africa and you see somebody with those beads, it should let you know that they are they are healer and and they've gone through uh, this process. So they've they, they have a connection between this world and and another realm. Um, and water, I, I guess this was my reference to my own uh, spiritual uh, life and my spiritual upbringing because I'm raised by a mother who has gone through this process of initiating. And in fact, that is how I came into being an artist because. Uh, She's a dreamer, and, and she, um, she's, she has visions. 
And um, whenever she would dream, as a child growing up, she would uh, retell uh, these stories, not even stories, but she would tell you, I saw this, I saw this in my dream. And in my mind, it, it, it sort of came together as a picture. So I still have that same kind of approach to my work. I don't have a, an academic uh, response to it. Uh, I, I, have a, I, I connect to my images from a spiritual standpoint. And then I invest into doing research and, and, and working through the medium to try to arrive at some image that we can all relate to. But all of these images somehow relate to my own spiritual uh, life. Uh, so each of the uh, figures in, in the boat uh, carrying something. So with the, this Lesoko, she's carrying the whip, and I'm holding that umbrella. Um, and there's all kinds of readings that uh, you can read into it. Uh, eventually, the boat fills up with water. Uh, so the, the video basically is, is, is uh, w at the beginning of it, at least with the two panels. Uh, at the beginning of it, you have these two figures standing. I don't know about the anatomy of, of the boat, but this part here. Uh, you have them standing there, and um, they then s sort of rest uh, on it, or like li lie down on it. Sorry, my English <laughs> it sort of escapes me at times, but they lie down in the boat, and uh, for the duration of the, uh, of the film, uh, the boat is gradually filling up with water. Um, and this has all kinds of references to climate and, and uh, the kind of floods that uh, we see in different parts of the world, which is part of, like, part of the reason why some people are um, migrating. migrating, yes. Yeah, so, so basically I'm, I'm, I'm just referring to uh, agents of migration from different, uh, different perspectives. So I also, um, again from these visions and these dreams, I know I wanted to have uh, a bird represented in, in the film. Uh, and I wanted to have a falcon. Um, which uh, can be trained um, to do all kinds of things. Um, but in this scenario, again, it's like this idea of a spirit animal uh, that connects you to um, another realm. But in, in, in this image, I wanted to uh, use it as a way of... So, so you have these figures that are floating in the middle of nowhere and you imagine that uh, they, are one, they are one concern is trying to find refuge. And when you are out in the ocean, refuge uh, comes in the form of like physical landmass. And I think even in, in the story of uh, in Noah's Ark, after the, the, this biblical flood, um, um, he sends out a bird to go see if uh, uh, there's a place uh, where the water has subsided and the bird brings back um, a leaf of some sort. Sorry, my, my, my biblical knowledge is, is not that great. But it's that kind of reference of sending out a bird which can take flight and land wherever and survey where refuge might be. And then it would then return to her and, and communicate this to her. So n now you have uh, this bird and then you have that staff that has birds by pure coincidence, but they, they're starting to connect in the, in the story of this, this particular uh, image. There's Lesoko again. Um, and then in 2017, I had a chance to do a performance. Uh, well, this was the first time uh, this project was shown in South Africa. And I was supposed to include installation images, but unfortunately, I, I didn't get the chance to do that. But we had um, uh, photographs uh, of, uh, like basically the same photographs I just showed you. And we had the film screened in, in, in um, sort of an immersive environment. And I wanted to have a live uh, uh, performance element that sort of refers to this project. And 
this is what we ended up coming up with. Again, we used the same boat that we used uh, to film with. And um, we had two, so we had three, three actors or three performers uh, 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 sort of playing out the scenario. Um, and I, I just like this, this, this space that we used. This, uh, this was an old synagogue in, in, in Cape Town. Uh, which was convert well now it's, it's it's sort of vacant and it's been used for different kinds of things, but I like that that shape is repeated uh, in the uh, uh, the arch is it the arch or the arc the arch uh, uh, over there and over there sort of it, you still have the three bolts there's that that and then that yeah um, and we uh, so this boat is filled with water, um, and the floor is also wet. And just by chance, uh, the lighting sort of started to reflect on the wall there, so it gives you that kind of aquatic environment. Um, so in, in this scenario, those could be read as like these guiding spirits that are now approaching uh, this stranded figure. She's brandishing the whip as in the video. And then there's that trinity again in the shadows. Where's the audience? The audience is where we are. Yeah. There, there, there's, there. There's the audience. <laughs> yes. Yes, so you will notice that uh, the, there's, this, there's a pulley system over here. Um, so, and over here there's a pianist who's playing to uh, these scenes as they play out. And somewhere over here that's me freaking out, trying, <laughs> <laughs> trying to make sure everything goes well. Um, yeah. And then uh, uh, at some point in, in the scene, uh, we had um, two people on either side sort of pulling this thing so that it, it sort of becomes upright. Uh, the audience didn't know about the setup, so they just saw this image coming. And so we had filled it with water, and, and just the sound of it going against this concrete floor was uh, incredible. Um, and as soon as that happens, uh, you, you start to find you see more of those kinds of reflections. So it, it's almost like connecting different planes into one surface. Um, and that was the last of, uh, that's the last image that people are confronted with. Yeah, so that's the passage, passage project. But I thought maybe instead of leaving you with that, uh, I could also show you some of the work that I've done after that. Uh, I was uh, commissioned to do a performance um, f by performer, this uh, performance biennale in New York. And I wanted, again, for some reason, I, st I keep going back to this idea of uh, uh, the erasure of uh, uh, histories that refer to, to uh, African people, or African uh, heritage. And uh, I did some research, found out that um, where Central Park is now, uh, there used to be an African village or a village of, of free African people uh, called S uh, Seneca. Uh, Sen yeah, Seneca. Um, and using uh, uh, something called eminent domain, uh, the civil authorities uh, moved uh, this community uh, of free black people in New York, which was unheard of at the time, uh, moved them out uh, to sort of have this park to compete with the parks in Europe and stuff. Um, and this was interesting to me because of this, um, what happens in South Africa in the 50s, where the British uh, colony uh, tries to get rid of uh, the black population in these urban centers and pushes them to the margins. So there's, there's a history of forced removals in South Africa that connects to me, uh, that I seen, or that I found in, in this scenario. So um, we, 
we did a performance in three sides. We did one at uh, uh, a church called the Mother Zion Church in Harlem. Uh, this was called the Freedom Church. It was part of the uh, Underground uh, Railroad. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a place where people arrive dead. Again, there's this idea of, of people fleeing, people migrating in search of refuge, <coughs> which uh, comes through in the work. Um, so we did the performance at this church, and we did uh, a performance uh, at Central Park, where we, like close to this archeo archaeological site where uh, remnants of this community were sort of excavated. And then the last site was... Uh, I, it wasn't by my choice, it was just uh, contractual. Uh, we did the last uh, iteration of this performance in Times Square. So, it's also a very long video, so I'll skip through it uh, at some point. So it, uh, the video begins this way, um, continues into this kind of uh, scene. So the idea was to respond to this kind of, the memory of these uh, 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 people that were erased and try to sort of reinsert them into these different contexts. Um, yeah, so that's what you're seeing there. Um, so we shot here at the Mother Zion Church. This project is called Zion to refer to, the, to this, this church. Then it goes into, okay, still continue. So it's basically an image of these people coming into the church and eventually uh, leaving through it. I'm oh, sorry. Um, this was uh, on the streets of Harlem. And then later on, we were in Central Park which was difficult to shoot at because we didn't have a permit and you have joggers and people who can go. Um, so I'll just show you a few seconds of this and I'll move on. Um, I, I think it might be. It might be on the website. So I wanted to have these kind of ghosts, ghostly figures uh, sort of trying to revive this memory of uh, this community that used to be there and uh, was no more. And did you choreograph at all? Yes, yes. Uh, I worked with a dance group called Harambe, which is ba based out of uh, the Bronx. Uh, but they, um, they do African dance and stuff like that. So we did choreography in Cape Town, rehearsed it, and then sent videos over so that when we met, we just uh, sort of all jumped into the choreography. Uh, that goes on for some time. Okay. So we close with... Uh, the drumming. Again, drumming is a way of reviving uh, uh, ancestral spirits uh, in, in, in my culture and tradition. 
Yes, and uh, I'll stop. I'll stop there. I have one more, but uh, I'll stop there because of time. Thank you so much. I don't know. I don't think is this on? Yes. Um, I think we've got Thank maybe you. time for a couple questions. If anyone would like to ask. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Thank you. And your aesthetic is absolutely beautiful. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, my question is, you're dealing with these incredibly deep subjects about your identity and your culture. Yes. After you get to a certain point where you have um, put this movement onto film, how do you take care of yourself? <sighs> that's, that's a very good question. Uh, um, Yeah, <laughs> that's a very good question. I, I have a very supportive family. Um, I rely on my mother's prayers quite a lot. Um, but I think over time I've, I've learned to sort of try to remove myself from, uh, from the work, which d d doesn't really work, but like, I, I, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Well, I noticed in passages that uh, the figures were generally in black dress. Yes. And you were in black dress, but these Central Park figures and in the church in New York City were in white. Yes. So I wondered about the reasons uh, for that choice. Um, I think it was... Uh I think just the way of, of uh, not representing the physical bodies of these folks, but also something uh, if, uh, spiritual and ephemeral, and, and, and uh, I wanted it to be ghostly. ghostly yes, oh. yes, yes, yes. Um, but also I just wanted to have that contrast with the landscape, uh, to have them in, in this park. I mean, if they were dressed in black, it, it would still be powerful, but the, they would sort of recede into uh, uh, the background. So I just wanted them to be present. Remember, this is uh, I'm trying to take this memory of these folks that were moved out and uh, this idea of dis uh, um, histories that have been uh, erased and sort of trying to make them present. So contrast for me between landscape and body is important. Uh, yeah. You just go down here, and then I will do you, and then I think that will be it. Um, hello. Uh, earlier you mentioned, okay, sorry. Hi. Earlier you mentioned that you prefer to show these in a U shape because yes. they're more immersive. Does the yes. same go for your other three-channel um, uh, video projects? No, no, not so much. Not so much. I, I, I'd be interested to see how this looks uh, as a image that wraps around. But yeah, so I, I think I'm constantly hoping for that kind of presentation, but you don't always get opportunities to show it that way. Because you have to actually build a structure if the room is not uh, the same, the, the right dimensions. Yeah. Um, I hesitate a little bit to ask this question, and you can feel completely free to not want to answer it, but yes. um, <clears throat> I'm just back from the current Venice Biennale. Yes where, of course, one of the pieces that has garnered the most attention is this very provocative and problematic yes. placement of the ship yes. uh, in the middle of the Arsenale. And um, in a way, now seeing your work, which is so layered with symbolism and all of this sort of like many, many layers of meaning and kind mm. of rich iconography all, almost, it's sort of the opposite kind of gesture. It's just so blunt, but by the Swiss artist Christoph Buchel, had this ship uh, from which 800 migrants in the Mediterranean uh, died, drowned yes. in 2015 or 16, I don't remember the exact date, yes. I think 2015, that's just set there as an object with, with like no contextual information whatsoever placed next to it. So I'm just curious to hear your perspectives on maybe that piece, but maybe also in relation to 
um, this like ongoing work on passages and migration and ships and mm. yeah. Um, we, we had a discussion uh, about this work as well. Um, so uh, my, my thing was that um, how do we as the, uh, the art audience feel about trauma being transformed into spectacle? Uh, but then maybe that's not what the gesture is about. Maybe the fact that we are talking about this boat that's all the way over there, maybe that's what the artist intended. I also heard that he didn't want to frame uh, or contextualize the work. He just wanted the boat or the ship to stand for, for itself. But um, I don't know. I think if the gesture was to uh, create a memorial for or this tragic loss of life, if that's the gesture, then I think maybe it's, it's, it, we can live with it. But then if it's really just uh, an exercise of one artist, um, showing this object to um, art dealers and, and uh, critics and stuff like that, maybe then you are, you are taking somebody's trauma and, and, and uh, putting it in, in, in display for your own, for your own benefit. So I can't be sure about that. But also, like, is it the artist that creates meaning or is it the audience that uh, layers or that uh, uh, endows an object or an artwork with meaning. Uh, and I think if uh, the majority of people feel disturbed by this kind of thing, then that is what the artwork has done. Um, yeah. Time is short, and um, I want to thank you again for coming. Um, tell other people to come and see this remarkable um, installation. And I would please join me in thanking Mohawk how again for coming and presenting today. Thank you.